All right, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Um, this is obviously a terrific opportunity to be able to address not only fellow researchers in the field, but of course the patients. Um, and so hopefully today I'll be able to provide some insight for you into the work we've done to better understand the epidemiology of NTM. Um, so I'll first go into the backgrounds on, epi on the epidemiology of NTM, and then I'll discuss a lot of the work that we've done and the findings from our studies focused on the epidemiology in the United States. And then lastly, I'll provide a brief summary as well as discuss from my perspective what some of the future research needs are in this field. So to start off, as many of you are probably already familiar with, uh, uh, NTM represent a group of environmental bacteria where there have been over 180 species identified to date, which vary greatly in their level of pathogenicity for people. Um, there's tremendous geographic variation in the species distribution as well as prevalence, which I'll get into soon. However, it's ubiquitous in soil and water samples in the environment throughout the country. Um, and of course, in susceptible individuals, it can cause severe pulmonary disease, which is often very chronic in nature. So if NTM is so common in the environment, why is it such a rare disease? And obviously, that's one of the most important questions in trying to better understand its epidemiology. So we know that you need to have environmental exposure to even become a, a case of NTM pulmonary disease. Uh, but that can vary uh, depending on the local soil sources that are present, the water sources, water distribution systems, and then of course just the environmental potential for mycobacteria. We know that certain climatic factors can increase mycobacterial abundance in the environment. But then, why is it such a rare disease if it's so common? And this is where the host factors become really important. So differences in people who actually are able to be susceptible for this disease. Uh, so there are behavioral factors that we know contribute, such as smoking can increase risk. Uh, certain activities are, of course, going to increase your exposure to environmental sources, like gardening, uh, indoor swimming pool use. Um, but more than anything, it seems that there are comorbid conditions as well as genetic factors that really seem to drive uh, NCM risk in people. So we've already discussed certain pulmonary defects such as persons with uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, as well as people diagnosed with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, connective tissue defects have been linked to an increased risk for NTM. And then there are other factors, uh, which I'll present some of the data here on today, that also seem to be associated with an increased risk, including uh, your race and ethnicity, which could be a proxy either for genetic factors or other behavioral factors as well. Um, and all of these result to produce, uh, combine to produce a, a risk for NTM lung disease. So it's been challenging to get a good understanding of the epidemiology in, of NTM in this country because it's not a reportable disease uh, for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, only 11 states actually report NTM cases uh, within the state. And the data that they even generate are of very poor quality uh, often. So it can be very challenging to understand what that national picture looks like. So we have to rely on other data sources to be able to understand uh, the epidemiology. And so this can include local studies uh, from single sites, uh, clinical sites or centers, uh, local surveillance efforts. But then we mostly rely on large national data sets that have been collected primarily for other purposes. Uh, as you know, uh, electronic medical records, that's a really important source of information these days. And so we've been working closely with uh, several companies that generate data sources like that to look at laboratory data at a national level. Um, as well as insurance-based data sets such as Medicare data. Um, and we're able to use these as they each present different strengths and limitations for being able to answer important questions. Another challenge I like to point out is that there are actually very rigid uh, clinical, microbiologic, and radiologic criteria that are required to actually meet the ATS and IDSA uh, defined diagnosis for pulmonary NTM disease. 
And this presents challenges in estimating the epidemiology of it and prevalence of this disease as well, because it requires um, the ability to access and utilize these resources to even meet that definition. And that varies by socioeconomic status. Obviously, if you are, uh, if you have a harder time seeking out medical care, you will be uh, less represented in epidemiologic studies that rely on that disease diagnosis. So one of the first studies that we did relied on Medicare data. Um, and again, this was a 5% sample of adults in the United States who are over age 65. And this was an important study for being able to really show clear geographic differences in prevalence. Again, this is using insurance uh, claims codes, so we know we were missing some cases. But the trends still persist, and we found that it is increasing over time by about 8% per year in prevalence, and that's something that's since been uh, verified in other studies as well. And again, you see there are major geographic differences. The darker the red here, the higher the prevalence in that state. And then Hawaii stood out as having a prevalence that was far greater than any other state in the country, um, closely followed by California and Florida. But again, Hawaii had double the prevalence of these other states. This study also was uh, able to let us look at the impact of race and ethnicity. And while the burden was carried largely uh, by white patients in this data set, Asian Americans and those that listed themselves as having Pacific Islander descent had a risk that was two times greater uh, for NTM lung disease uh, than other patients in this data set. We also were able to work with these data to look at environmental risk factors. Uh, counties that seem to be at greater risk for NTM uh, relative to other parts of the United States. And there we found that there were certain soil characteristics that seemed to increase risk, but by far uh, these counties had the characteristics that they had more water in the area. So this was water on the land as well as water in the atmosphere. Um, and there's a variable listed there, evapotranspiration, which can be a little confusing to think about, but essentially it's getting at that principle of moisture persisting for greater periods of time in that lower level atmosphere that we are interacting with and breathing in. Um, and that's something that has been consistently shown in some of our other studies as well. So because it can be so challenging to understand the epidemiology of NTM given how ubiquitous it is in the environment, Hawaii really has stood out to us as an important place to try to answer some of these questions. Not only do you have the highest environmental risk, it seems, but um, as you may or may not know, about 40% of the population in Hawaii is of Asian descent. So it's a really uh, interesting area to study to better understand the dynamics here. Um, so we work closely with Kaiser Permanente. Uh, it rep they represented about 300,000 Hawaiian residents or a third of the state. And we also had species specific information. And there we found that yes, NTM is increasing in prevalence over time in Hawaii as well. But this was actually driven by Mycobacterium avium complex or MAC. So it appears MAC was increasing over time, whereas the other uh, NTM species we looked at remained stable. And then we also compared this to tuberculosis because Hawaii is also a high TB prevalent state. So when we looked by age group within Hawaii, um, similar to Medicare data, we found that uh, prevalence soared among those that are over age 65. But you could see here, it, the estimates are about double what we got for that same state from the Medicare data. So what that shows is that any uh, study relying on insurance claims codes is going to be missing at least about half the cases compared to when you use laboratory data. Um, and so, yeah, you could see there for the over 65 population, it's about 700 cases per 100,000 persons. And when we looked by a specific uh, ethnicity and background, we also, again, saw a risk that was about double compared to white patients and those that were Chinese, Japanese, Korean, or Vietnamese. Um, and again, this is across all age groups. So you can see relative to other estimates from other studies how high the prevalence is there. Um, and in contrast, Native Hawaiians actually have a much lower prevalence relative to others. <laughs> 
And then this is also just demonstrating uh, that broken down by race and ethnicity as well as age group. And you can just see how the numbers skyrocket here now for those highest risk groups where it's almost 1,000 cases per 100,000 persons in the state of Hawaii. So another thing we were interested in really understanding is does increased exposure in a high-risk environment increase your risk of becoming an NTM lung disease case? And uh, while we didn't have information on the time of residence in Hawaii, we did have information on the time that they were in our system, in our database system. And we found for NTM there was this dose-response relationship with the more num greater numbers of years that you lived in Hawaii or that you were in the Kaiser system the higher uh, your risk for NTM. And this is after controlling for age, meaning this is not a result of just people aging over time. And then uh, we found different comorbid conditions, which we already have discussed extensively, that increased risk for NTM, bronchiectasis as well as COPD. Um, but notably, that didn't increase your risk for TB, just NTM. And when we were able to compare M obsessus risk to the risk for MAC, uh, we actually found some interesting differences. So while uh, Asian Americans were at greater risk for both species, only Japanese patients were at higher risk for M obsessus. Um, they were not at increased risk for MAC. Um, and then when we were looking at comorbid conditions, while patients with bronchiectasis were at higher risk for both species, only those with COPD were at higher risk for MAC, and COPD is often uh, correlated with smoking, and so it does seem like there was a little bit more of that component potentially driving your risk for MAC. Um, and then similarly with the number of years uh, that someone was present in the Kaiser system, that seemed to increase your risk for MAC, but not for M. obsessus. And then we were able to look at differences uh, across islands and by zip code. And, and while we do have a much higher prevalence in Oahu relative to other islands, we also had a much greater representation of Oahu. So while it's hard to know um, if those are true environmental differences or not, within Oahu, we did look at zip code level differences. And again, even in Hawaii, we found that zip codes that had a greater percentage of water coverage in the area were associated with a higher risk. And this is after controlling for other relevant epidemiologic factors. Um, but again, another component also showing up as higher prevalence was related to the median uh, household income level there. And again, I think that gets at the importance of uh, having the ability to access and utilize medical care, because even though all of these individuals had access to the Kaiser system, there still is going to be that difference in who's going to actually end up getting diagnosed with this disease. And now I want to discuss some of the work uh, focused on uh, patients with cystic fibrosis. And so we've worked closely with the CF Foundation's Patient Registry Database, which is just a wealth of information. Um, the CF patients have a prevalence that's about 90 times greater than the general population. Um, and even within that population, we are seeing an increase over time of about 5% per year, as well as species-specific differences in risk and in outcomes. And so using that data set, we were able to also look at geographic differences uh, by state. And again, you can see there are some similarities with when you compare it to the general population. And Hawaii has a prevalence of 50%. Half of all CF patients who live in Hawaii will become positive over time for NTM. Um, and then in Florida, it's about 30%, so very high. We also were interested in looking at differences in distribution by species by state, and what you'll see is there is this pattern that those states you typically think of as your high risk, high prevalence NTM states have more M obsessus. And again, I think this gets at the fact that M obsessus is more challenging to treat, um, it's, it takes much longer time to clear it, and so I do think you have uh, the ability to um, see a higher prevalence in that state driven largely by M obsessus. And then to comment actually relevant to the panel that was just here, um, when we looked at uh, the CF data and we looked at the age at which a person was diagnosed with their CF disease, 
what you'll find is NTM is much more prevalent in CF patients that were diagnosed later in life. Um, and again, these are individuals who seem to have milder uh, CF disease, and it's not until they're older and it's much later in life that they even get that diagnosis, potentially even because of their NTM infection. And lastly, we looked at a study, uh, we, we've worked closely with um, a military uh, CF center in Hawaii. And uh, again, to get at that dose response relationship, and what you can see here is the number of years that a CF patient resides in Hawaii greatly increases their risk of becoming positive for NTM. In that under age uh, 12, in that under 12 year old age group, you can see that for those that are in Hawaii for six or more years, everybody became positive. Um, and when you look across all age groups, it went from 19% to 42% to 80% over extended periods of time. And this is a military population. So these are individuals who were transferred for military orders into Hawaii. So we know what their NTM status was when they first got there. And then lastly, this is a slide from another group that again just shows that relationship. This is within Florida and uh, CF patients that were positive for NTM uh, lived closer to a significant water source uh, than those who were NTM negative. So I'm not going to get into all the details on these summaries um, oh, because I know we have time constraints. But again, just to uh, summarize that the host risk factors include a mix of structural, immunologic, and genetic factors that seem to increase an individual's risk for NTM. Um, and then certain treatments do seem to modify this risk. Um, so we know, for instance, uh, patients on TNF alpha blockers uh, have an increased risk uh, by inhibiting their immune response to NTM, while as in CF, uh, it's common practice for patients to be on chronic macrolides, and that does appear to be protective against acquiring an initial NTM infection. For environmental factors, again, there's tremendous geographic variation in prevalence as well as the species distribution. Um, so we know certain areas have a much higher risk for NTM than others, even though it is present across the country in all states. And then Hawaii is consistently identified as being the highest risk location. Um, with other hotspots, that tend to be associated with more M abscesses as well. In terms of household risk factors, we know that household water sources, water pipe biofilms, uh, likely present a viable exposure source, a significant source of exposure, um, as well as uh, soil and dust that's particularly uh, relevant within a house. We have identified pathogenic mycobacteria from these samples that can match uh, the strain that somebody is infected with. But in terms of behavioral risk factors, it's really challenging to pinpoint any one behavior that can increase your risk. And this is difficult to assess because it's a rare disease, it's common in the environment, and these exposures, showering, bathing, these are very common. Um, so while some studies have identified a few factors that might be relevant, indoor swimming pool use, um, you know, gardening uh, related exposures, it, these don't account for the vast majority of cases. So again, we know it's increasing over time. There's a greater burden on older adults as well as persons of Asian ancestry and those with uh, known structural and genetic pulmonary uh, diseases. And obviously there are likely other uh, undetected uh, pulmonary related genetic defects that are contributing to risk at this point. Um, and then there's this wide geographic variation in risk as well as species. So future studies are definitely needed on species-specific environmental reservoirs, uh, understanding genetic modifications of risk that are currently uh, not identified, um, as well as risk for not just initial infection in individuals, but reinfection. That's something that hasn't been uh, focused on as much as I think is necessary uh, moving forward, given the chronic nature of this disease. And then lastly, what are the mechanisms behind this observed dose response relationship we're seeing with the environment over periods of years? There are many groups that were involved in work I've presented here today, and thank you. <laughs>